Okay, everybody, we're going to get started now, and we're going to go ahead and jump down the agenda to Adam, who's here to give us an update on the Rungus catalog resume and how that's coming along. Hello, everybody. It's nice to be here. It's nice to be here. So I talked to some, many of you like six months ago, and then we were all in masks in here and sitting far apart from each other. It's nice to be in a mask optional uh, zone. Uh, it's nice to see everybody. Um, so I would, I'm just going to share a few things uh, from what uh, I've been finding in the last six months about Rungus and hopefully some fun tangential facts. Um, and I want to thank the sponsors of this project. I wouldn't be doing this, at, this without um, the Grangers and the Kurs, who are the, the complete underwriters of this whole project. Um, so thanks so much to them. All right, if you um, started the Rungus Raisin A almost a year ago, a little more than a year ago, um, and one of the most public faces of it is uh, a web page on the NMWA website. So if you're out and about and someone for some reason asks you about it, you can direct them to this web page, which is on the art tab, Rungus Raisin A. It has what information we've got so far. Um, right now we're collecting info. Um, from sources that we know, like museums, this, you know, our collection here, um, illustrations that he did, etc. So we haven't opened it up to um, outside collections yet, but that'll be coming in the near future. And when those kind of things happen, we'll update the web page. And so people can go there to find uh, out more info. Oh my gosh, I'm totally hitting the wrong thing. Okay, click it. There we go. Um, so when we last met, we talked about Carl and his cousin Carl, Carl Fulda, um, had just come back from the Wind Rivers with 900 pounds of trophies. Um, and Rungus said of that, uh, it was also new to us that we collected everything. So they were out in the Wind Rivers. Uh, they just brought back as many heads and horns and birds and squirrels and stuff as they could possibly find. Um, in 1996, Rungus returns to Germany for a year, which is something I think we forget fairly often. And apparently, <laughs> I just found out that he donated most of this 900 pounds, 900 pound collection to the museum, uh, Natural Museum, uh, Natural History Museum in Berlin. So he didn't come back with all of it to the United States. He was probably happy to be shed of some of it. Um, he goes to Wyoming again in 1897, um, starts illustrating in 1898, goes to New Brunswick in 1901, and takes a big trip to the Yukon in 1904. So that's kind of a big timeline of what he's, uh, what he's up to. Um, he does really start also illustrating for books during this time period, um, 1901 to 1909, 1910, thereabouts. Um, begins to illustrate books, um, enlarges his professional and social circles in conservation, political, and artistic worlds. And so you can really see on this list some famous names that you'll recognize and that we'll have tangential conversations about in a minute. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, George Bird Grinnell, famous conservationist, Owen Wister, famous Western author, William Temple Hornaday from the New York Zoological Society, um, and Charles Sheldon, another famous naturalist who takes him to the Yukon. Um, so one of the things that we talked about last time was his hunting pictures and how he had this interesting sense of perspective. Normally in a hunting picture, you, the viewer of the painting, are in the position of the hunter and you're sort of looking at the deer or the elk and you might even be shooting it, etc. Rungus quite often did this opposite approach where the hunter's way in the background and the animals are in the foreground. And then you're sort of not exactly on the receiving end of the, the fire, but you're in kind of that realm of the animals. So this is still something that's happening and we're going to continue to trace it because I think it is really interesting in terms of his own perspective and his way of framing these uh, devices these images. Um, okay, one of the biggest early uh, books that he illustrates is The Deer Family that has an essay by Teddy Roosevelt. Right before Roosevelt goes into the presidency, I think he wrote his essays for this book. Um, 
one of his first big commissions and also one of the first times that he faces any kind of criticism. And so if you look at this image and you look at the title, it says white tail in flight. And can any of you guess or based on your animal knowledge, understand why it's not white tail in flight? <laughs> Exactly, because it's a mule deer. I knew you all would get this, but just in case, I brought this along. Mule deer, of course, have forking antlers and white tails have uh, antlers that come off of one tine. And then the tail is more of a mule deer or a black tail tail, etc. cetera. Um, so this wasn't really a criticism of his uh, illustrations. It was more either a misprint or something got miscommunicated when this all got put together. But he doesn't get criticized very often, and this is just a minor, minor little event in his life. But talking about Roosevelt, we're going to go on a tangent, like I said we would. Um, so Roosevelt was president uh, from 1901 to 1909, and he runs for a third term in 1912 against William Howard Taft. Um, the Republicans lose that election to Democrat Woodrow Wilson, in part because the Republican Party has split into two factions, which you might, you know, draw parallels to today. Um, so while all on the campaign trail in um, 1912, a deranged supporter of Woodrow Wilson shoots Roosevelt almost point blank range uh, in his chest in an assassination attempt. Um, the bullet was stopped or slowed by this picture on your right, which uh, is Teddy Roosevelt's 50 page speech that he had folded up in his pocket and his glasses case. So the bullet goes through those things. It does injure Roosevelt, um, but he goes on to make his speech that night, all 50 pages of it. Um, he collapses after the speech and exhaustion. He goes to the hospital, etc. It's a big deal, but he is um, showing how strong and etc. He is, and somewhere in this timeline, he says, "You see, it takes more than that to kill a bull moose," and thus, the progressive arm of the Republican Party is called the Bull Moose Party. So I'm sure you've heard that before. And what kind of subject matter, if you were Teddy Roosevelt, would you start collecting after such a moniker was conferred upon you? Um, maybe some moose paintings. Um, so Teddy Roosevelt recuperates for two weeks before he resumes going on the campaign trail. Um, he makes a speech at Madison Square Garden on October 28th, um, but his birthday is October 27th. And he was recuperating his, at his home in Sagamore Hill, which is on Long Island. And lines of people came to visit him and wish him well. He didn't necessarily let everyone in the door, um, but people left him gifts outside. One woman brought a painting by another artist and left it outside his gates. Um, a famous Long Island, or a well-known Long Islander, August Hexler, gave him this painting of a bull moose, um, which is called in the copyright records going to his doom, which might not be the best name for a painting to give someone who's running for uh, office. Um, I think Sagamore Hill, it's still in Sagamore Hill to this day, calls it charging moose. Um, but anyway, maybe that was a, a bad omen because Roosevelt, Roosevelt did not win that third attempt uh, at office. So, One more tangent on Roosevelt, and then we'll go back to our main storyline. Um, in 1913, a year later, after his assassination attempt, his birthday, his speech at Madison Square Garden, and Rung, Roosevelt goes to Rungus's studio to exchange yet a different painting by Rungus that someone had given him. Um, and so Rungus exchanges this other painting for the painting you see up on the screen, which is Lord of the Forest, probably a better title for a future running president. Um, and then also Roosevelt buys the casting of Alert, which is Rungus' moose sculpture, which we have a casting of out in the gallery. Um, Roosevelt then mentions Rungus in his autobiography of 1913, saying, there is a picture of a bull moose by Carl Rungus in his home, which seems to me as spirited, spirited an animal painting as I have ever seen. So you see Roosevelt really embracing Rungus um, 
as a, an artist that he enjoys. And so you have that really nice big connection there. Um, we move on to Rungus's next book that he illustrates with the fascinating title of Musk Ox, Bison, Sheep, and Goat. Um, <laughs> they couldn't come up with anything better for that. Uh, essays by Casper Whitney, George Bird Grinnell, and Owen Wister. Casper Whitney was the editor-in-chief of Outing Magazine that, that Rungus was illustrating for. George Bird Grinnell, you may be familiar with, a very famous early conservationist, helped save the American bison from extinction. And then Owen Wister, you're all, I assume, familiar with him, great friends with Frederick Remington, author of The Virginian, which is the quintessential Western novel, Western story, upon which almost every single other Western movie, story, etc., is based. So he was in, you know, acknowledged during his era um, as being that, that wonderful and important of a person. Um, interestingly enough, and I hadn't ever made this connection in my head, Mount Wister, right out here in the Teton Range, is named after Owen Wister. And I didn't know if you all knew that, but I just thought that was a fascinating little local twist. So we have Mount Moran for Thomas Moran, Mount Wister for Owen Wister. And Mount Owen for, no, yeah, not Owen Wister, but, so I did look this up because uh, I wanted to know what I was talking about. I think Mount Owen was named after one of the first uh, white people to climb the Grand Teton. That's my, that's my understanding. A contested uh, summit, whether that was the first person to climb the Grand Teton. Um, so let's continue. Still Hunter, really interesting book about deer hunting methods. Here's a great white-tailed deer illustration you can see by the horns there. Um, really nice illustrations, really nice reproductions in this book. Um, illustrates the uh, uh, American Natural History by William Temple Hornaday, who you know would go on to commission those huge paintings that are in uh, the lobby um, and the ones that are at Buffalo Bill as well. Um, does a book, well, maybe does this book uh, called The Life of Animals by Ernest Ingersoll. There's no credit in this book for any Rungus illustrations and they cut off all of the borders of the illustrations, so you can't even see his name. And I only found out that he had illustrated this book because of a list that Doug Allen, the artist had made. Doug Allen is a really big Rungus fan. He'd made a list and this was on it. So I went and checked it out. Um, probably the biggest publication um, of his later book illustration life was Wilderness of the Upper Yukon written by Charles Sheldon. There's a Sheldon National Wildlife Refuge for pronghorn that I think is in Utah or Nevada. Uh, Sheldon has been known as the father of Denali National Park for advocating it to become a national park. Um, Sheldon finances this trip in 1904 with Rungus and naturalist uh, Osgood to explore the upper Yukon and they're looking for mountain sheep, doll sheep, stone sheep, and bighorn sheep. Um, Sheldon, okay, here's a tangent again. After uh, Sheldon became independently wealthy as an administrator of various railroad projects and owning a stake in a silver mine, he spent the rest of his life doing expeditions like this, going off into the Yukon or other wilderness areas, exploring, hunting, bringing back specimens, etc. cetera. Um, and on these trips, he would often take people like Rungus, Osgood, and uh, also on part of this trip that they went on was this guy named Frederick Selous, Selous who is a very well-known uh, hunter at the time. And I'll say more about him in a second. So uh, more, a couple more fun reviews for you. Uh, the first one I'll read a little bit of. The Beauty of this Remote Region. This is a book review of the wilderness of the Upper Yukon, um, widely applauded. The beauty of this remote region is exemplified by Mr. Sheldon's practiced pen and the excellent illustrations in color contributed by Carl Rungus. Another person says, um, Carl Rungus contributes a number of capital drawings to the present volume, which includes as well a number of original photographs and camp scenes, animal life and scenery. So in general, really positive feelings about Rungus's contributions. One reviewer there at the bottom from London was not as impressed. 
He said, the book is profusely illustrated with reproductions of photographs, which give an admirable idea of the stern character of the country, and also contains some drawings and rather weird colored plates by Mr. Carl Rungus. So given the, uh, granted the color reproduction technology at this point in 1909 was not uh, amazing and the, the reproductions are a little bit kind of funny, but I don't know, I don't know if they're weird. Uh, so anyway, uh, what's fun is this painting right here, Precipice Upon Precipice, included in the, the book and also is in this collection and I think might be in the Rungus Gallery. I can't remember if it's still in there or not. Um, illustrating Rungus's trip to the Yukon, which is an important part of his growing again, these circles of influence and people. Now back to Frederick Selous, a uh, famous hunter, naturalist, conservationist, and author. Um, he, for example, led Teddy Roosevelt's African Safari in 1909 kind of the epitome of the great white hunter. And in fact, he's the inspiration for H. Ryder Haggard's character, Alan Quarter, Quatermain, uh, who's the hero of King Solomon's Mines. So this is kind of the group of people that Rungus is hanging around with, which is pretty impressive in which I, um, again, like I hadn't quite realized this kind of stuff before. And then um, the King Solomon's Mines, not only a book, but it's been made into a movie about five times. The last time was in 1985. Uh, this was kind of a spoof of the Indiana Jones films uh, starring Richard Chamberlain and an early role for Sharon Stone back there in the background. So another funny little, little piece of info in there. Um, so I tried to come up with some kind of graphic or something that might show all these different relations and the Venn diagram got really confusing. Um, so this is sort of a honeycomb that links everybody. But anyway, just having the time to do all this research and put all these things together really is amazing for me just to, to see the depth of um, Rungus's connections and how important uh, these these relationships were and how kind of widespread and he's hanging out with like an Indiana Jones like figure. So that is pretty interesting. Um, how are we doing on time? It's quarter of, so I'll go through, I only have a few more. Um, what we've been working on and I think uh, Melissa who is, who is helping me on this project from the Bay area is on the call and she's been incredibly helpful uh, cataloging all these things and doing research. We first started working on this amazing, uh oh, how do I go back? Oh wait, I figured it out. So Bill Kerr in the late 80s put together these amazing binders of black and white photos and copyright registrations that Rungus uh, applied for um, in the early 1900s. And those have been in the library for this whole time. And so luckily they, they didn't get lost. They didn't get moved anywhere. So I have those at home. We've been scanning them and entering them into the collections database here at the museum. Without them, I mean, this is like the foundation of all of this research. There's about a hundred records that Ranga sent in. This is the first one called the Battle Royale. Copy, copyright 1902 by Carl Rungus, not spelled correctly by whoever typed that up. Um, there's a few of those funny things. People can't spell Rungus. Each one's accompanied by a little, almost like a library card that tells you the title, a brief description. Unfortunately, it doesn't have the size, which would help us out in cases where we don't exactly know what's happening. Uh, like this one doesn't have an image with it. And so somewhere on our list, we need to find an antelope painting from 1902. So that's one of those you know, things that uh, is going to be a challenge as we move forward. Uh, here's an example of that collections database screen. So you can see for many of the entries, we've got an image. And then if you click further, you get a catalog card. But for some like those down in the bottom right hand corner, just a catalog card that requires further research. And then to end, um, I called this paint what you know for the most part. So in unlike his illustrations where sometimes he had to draw things that he didn't see in the wild, for his paintings, as we know, he really 
painted what he saw and hunted out in the wilderness. So Wyoming and New Brunswick, of course, you have pronghorn, you have elk, you have moose. Yukon and Alaska, you start to see things like caribou, this enormous Alaskan moose, and then doll sheep, which was a highlight of that trip to the Yukon. And then it's really nice when we have the black and white image from the copyright files and the color image, because we own that painting here at the museum. So those kind of connections are amazing when they happen. And you get to start seeing, seeing things in color, which is also really fun, uh, as opposed to everything in black and white. So there's still the anomaly every once in a while where he is painting something that he never saw in real life and never hunted and never really studied. Um, this is sort of an homage by him to Kuhner to Frieza, which is called Hunters, painted in 1906. There are the occasional, you know, lions that crop up every once in a while. There's a gorilla that was at the um, New York Zoological Society. And the funniest one is a panda that he painted for Roosevelt's son that he did based on their verbal description of what a panda looked like. So maybe I'll, I'll find that one for next time and bring it up, I think. Oh, okay, one thing that I found recently, um, more of these calendars keep popping up that have Rungus illustrations that I didn't know about. This Remington one from 1909 is a portion of a larger painting that they used for an advertisement. And then this uh, one on the other side is bugling elk. Um, and I assume maybe some company you could buy this calendar from and have your name printed at the top and you would have a nice little thing to hang in your, wherever, your office. So that I think, yeah, Battle Creek, Michigan, the fine clothing and furnishing store. Yeah, that is it. If there are any questions, I could answer them. Um, if not, that's great too. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. So now on, on my agenda, we have Michelle and Stephanie. If you guys want to come up and is there anything you need me to pull up like the website or anything like that for you? Okay. So if you all haven't met Stephanie, a lot of you maybe haven't. This is Stephanie Nishio. She's the programs and events coordinator. What, which, coordinator. Coordinator of events. Is that your title? Events coordinator. Events coordinator. Okay, perfect. <laughs> and I'm Michelle Dixon. I've met um, some of you. I had the pleasure of going on a cross-country ski outing uh, with volunteers earlier. And then I've spoken to a couple of folks throughout the past months as people have returned to the museum. So it's really nice to meet everyone. Um, so I just thought I would start with a few introductions for people who haven't met us. Um, and I'll let Stephanie go first. Um, yeah, my name's Stephanie. I have been here, I've been living in Victor Drake for the past couple of years. Um, kind of hopped around throughout uh, different hospitality jobs. Um, worked at RMC with Michelle prior to this. And uh, she brought me on about uh, three weeks, well, officially three weeks ago. <laughs> and couldn't be and couldn't be happier about it. So, um, and as I said, my name is Michelle Dixon. I've lived in Jackson for about, oh, almost 17 years. And I was most recently with RMC, which is a, a company, um, it's based out of Colorado, but they have uh, offices in 11 locations. One of them is here in Jackson. It's been in the Valley since about 2007. And uh, my predominant role was as director of operations. So I was planning corporate events for uh, people from other places that were coming into Jackson. Um, and then I served as the trainer on the corporate level for the last four years of my eight year employment there. I'm super happy to have landed at the museum. Uh, this is very exciting for me and I love seeing all the faces and it's uh, great knowing that there are folks joining us from home as well. So I thought it might be a helpful refresher to sort of um, review what it is that Stephanie and I do. Um, Stephanie's in a really unique position that it's, as my understanding, the first time that we've had this, where Stephanie is actually supporting both me and Wendy uh, with the outside groups that are coming in. So um, you're going to see Stephanie in a lot of different capacities, and we're very lucky to have her. And then as far as our team goes, we oversee a lot of the fun things that the public can have access to. So uh, we oversee Plein Air Fest, Western Visions, Yoga on the Trail, First Sundays, 
uh, black tail gala, black bear ball. So that's the stuff that Steph and I will uh, be hopefully reaching out uh, to your friendly faces to help us with. We do understand and appreciate how valuable the volunteer contribution is to the success of these events. So we're really looking forward to getting to know all of you on a little bit greater basis. Um, one other thing that Stephanie and I will be doing is this year we are returning to doing a few special opening parties for some of our specific exhibits. Um, and really happy to say that we'll be hosting uh, an opening party for the National Geographic um, 50 Best that is opening in November. So that's the first time it's my understanding that we've had an opening party for an exhibit in quite a while. So happy, happy to be a part of that. Uh, so I thought we would shift to a little bit of an update on Plein Air Fest. We've had a lot of questions uh, from uh, the community, from volunteers, from our employees, because everybody wants to know, are we returning to in-person events this year? And, and we're really excited that we are. So if you have not heard, we are planning on hosting Plein Air Fest live and in person outside on the museum grounds this year. The date is Saturday, uh, June 19th, and it's our standard time frame uh, from 10 to 2. Um, most of the stuff that you have enjoyed in the past is actually going to be returning. We will have about 50 artists, I think, that we're looking at this year. So we're very happy that they're willing to join us uh, for this endeavor this year. We've got live music planned. We have food from Palette. And uh, we will actually be sticking around, Stephanie and I, after this meeting. Um, we do have some signups available. And I believe as of maybe tomorrow, Rachel may have those available in VicNet yeah, as well. So we're not sure, but we <laughs> thought that since we had you guys here, it would be a wonderful opportunity for us to say hello face to face and give people an opportunity to sign up if you'd like to do so today. But look for the rest of those signups to be available um, the rest of this week. Um, so the other update I wanted to provide is on Western Vision. Same thing, a lot of questions coming in. I know this is a, a favorite event. And yes, we are having an in-person live Western Visions event here this year. So uh, really happy for the work that the community has done to allow us to return to in-person events. Uh, the agenda is a little bit different than it has been in the past. Um, for this year, the jewelry lunch table and uh, we are going with kind of a more streamlined um, agenda for this event so on Wednesday September 15th we'll be hosting an artist only welcome reception so that's slightly different than the past um, as our way of saying welcome back and thank you to the artists this will give them an opportunity to network with one another uh, check out each other's artwork um, reconnect maybe a mentor or meet a mentor. So we're really happy to be hosting that for the artists on the 15th. On Thursday, September 16th, that is the day that we will return to our live in-person artist panel discussion uh, from 10 to noon. And then of course that evening is our, our wonderful classic show and sale. Um, so a few things to be excited about this year. We have a slightly different format. We are of course, glad to be hosting people in person, but we do realize that there is a component um, of our historical attendance that may not feel comfortable. So for the first time, we are actually hosting a hybrid event for the Western Vision Show and Sale this year. So there will be the ability to join uh, virtually. Um, both virtual and in-person attendance will be ticketed. And um, that is probably our biggest change. We are also returning to the intent to purchase format, which you may have seen last year, that was not possible when they had to switch to everything online. They did more of a buy it now uh, feature on an extended website, but we will be returning to just that uh, initial evening of intent to purchase. And we've formed a really wonderful partnership with an, a new uh, company that we're working with um, that's created a custom platform for us that will allow people online and people here at the party to both express intent to purchase. So some fun things coming down the line that way. Um, and aside from that, we will be available for questions afterwards, but it's really lovely to see everybody in person. Um, Stephanie and I office right next to Rachel's current office. So if you're in the building, please feel free to stop by and say hello to us and we look forward to meeting you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You two are great to work with. So I'm really glad you're here. <laughs>
I'll mention quickly, um, we've been working a little bit as far as plein air fest goes and um, sort of rewriting some of the job descriptions. And so I did print off um, the form over there if you feel like signing up for a shift already. Um, the job descriptions are typed in there with a little bit more specifics than was on there in previous years. So I think that'll be helpful. And um, so feel free to go ahead and do that. And then like she said, I'll, I'll get it up on VicNet to sign up there too uh, shortly. Okay, so I am going to chat for a couple minutes here about Make It Wild and just kind of share with you some stats. Um, well, not so much stats really, but some survey results. Um, so Make It Wild, of course, was our um, series of four online art making courses um, that took place December through March. And uh, the proceeds, of course, went towards our high school art leadership scholarship in the memory of Dick Jennings. Um, so recordings can still be purchased on our website. They're $20 a piece. And too bad this, uh, this format's all screwy on this, but... What I wanted to say was um, a couple of the, the surveys, the things that stood out in the survey, um, the length, we did an hour and a half long class and almost 90% said that length was just right. Um, the cost, 89.7 said just right. The, um, so when you bought a live um, ticket to the class and took it in real time, um, through the internet, you could also receive the recording with that. And this is showing that 65.5% um, of the people um, that got a live class said they watched it on their own time. So that was kind of interesting. Um, the length of each class. Okay, there we go. This was great too. How confident are you in applying what you have learned in Make It Wild? And it averaged, it was a zero to 10. Zero was... Um, not confident and 10 was very confident and um, everything was like a six and above and the 10 had a lot. I can't read this because the chart didn't, didn't show, but at any rate, that was really great to see that. Um, and then I had a few things that people had to say. We asked um, one thing you enjoyed the most about Make It Wild was uh, somebody said the classes were wonderful. I paint in oils typically, so I enjoyed the different mediums. Love the classes and would be interested when or if you give it another go. Um, accessibility to different mediums came up a lot in the survey. People enjoyed having a variety of things to play with. I really enjoyed so much doing the pastel session with Jen. I learned a lot about the safety involved in working with the medium and pace of the instruction was wonderful. Bonus seeing the happiness in all the people who participated and shared their work and seeing everyone's smiling faces. Jennifer Hoffman was enthusiastic and compelling. She motivated me to try pastels. The artists were also very good teachers and picked good material. I wish there could be two or three classes with the same artist as part of the series so we could finish our pieces. Um, good variety of subjects, well-prepared presentations. Thank you very much. Every presenting artist was personable, interesting, and an excellent instructor. instructor how much I learned, how much I improved, and how much absolute fun it was. So I'm pleased with the feedback from that. And we do plan to um, do Make It Wild again. So look for that, uh, another series coming up. So this in general was geared towards adults and most of the, at least the live participants that I can remember were adults with only a couple of exceptions where there were some younger kids that kind of joined with their parents. Um, so, I mean, I would have to look back and see for sure what, you know, more specifics about the demographics of the, the survey responders, but we had 29 responses, I think, 29 or 39. Um, we had a really good response rate. Um, so in general, they were adults, but I couldn't tell you uh, an average age of the adults. Does that answer your question? No, no not remotely. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, right. Okay, so the people who took the survey were all people who attended the class live. Do 
Right. I mean, it was it was pretty all over the board. I mean, I know there were definitely we didn't we saw them right. Yeah, six definitely sixties, some seventies, probably some low seventies, but I would put it in the forty to sixty range overall. Yeah, if I had to guess an average, I would say the forty to sixty was average. Right. Pretty much. Yeah. They did. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions about Make It Wild or anything so far? Well, yes, it's tricky because we had, I think we sold over 60 live classes. Okay. But not all the people showed up. Like they purchased it live and then didn't show up. And so those people received a recording and watched it. And the number of people varied from class to class. So one class had, I think, 12 or 14, and another had 34. So it's kind of all over the board. Also, some of those who responded did more than one class. Right. They responded, but they actually did four classes in that class. Right. So they were responding. So you don't really have a plan. Watch them going to work. How did Mrs. Jenny feel about the money? Right. Right. Well, we, we exceeded our goal for fundraising, so we're pleased with that. I was trying to find the the exact amount, and I couldn't find it yesterday. And yeah, it was under five thousand, but oh, pretty well over four thousand. So, yep. Right. Yeah, there are definitely advantages to doing it virtually, which was was surprising. But when you think about doing an in person class, if you have thirty four people like we did in a couple of those classes, it's hard for that many people to crowd around an artist while they work to actually see what's going on, um, or to do your own work. You'd have to be so spread out. Um, so there were definitely advantages to doing it with Zoom, and overall, it went really well. Technologically, surprisingly, knock on wood, it went it went really well. <laughs> okay. I think we can move on from that topic. I wanted to mention, um, just drop the new employee names for you all again with our meeting not starting on time. <laughs> it's kind of a mess to actually introduce people here today, but um, we have a new security services officer named Dustin. Uh, we have Elizabeth Burney, who's our major gifts officer and Stephanie, who you met briefly. Um, at the admissions desk, we have a summer seasonal, Kay Anderson. And then we have two interns over the summer, one for education, of course, and one for curatorial, like we always do. Um, education curator's name um, is Coyote Shook, and the curatorial intern is Kelsey Olney Wall. And they were both able to find some housing, maybe not 100% ideal, but they do have housing, so they're taken care of in that regard. So I have a new office location shortly where we added three new office spaces off of the classroom. So the Asperity classroom, which has been used by Pallet, um, is gonna be three new staff offices because we're pretty short in office space. So myself and um, Sari and Wendy's offices will be in those three new spaces. So I don't have a move in date yet because they still need to do the data on the phone line in there but I imagine it'll be in the next few weeks. So I'll make sure that you guys know when I'm officially moved over there so that you can try to find me. Okay, volunteer leadership committee. So the volunteer leadership committee, I wanted to just refresh everybody's memory on what that is and who the current VLC members are. We call it VLC for short. Um, it's generally a two-year term and time kind of got away from me and I'm realizing that a lot of our VLC members have been on for more than two years. And so I want to try to start rotating some of those people off. I don't want to lose everybody all at once and have to restart with a whole new group. Um, but over the next year, I'd like to kind of give people an opportunity to rotate off or to join our committee. So as um, a reminder, the mission of the VLC is to support the National Museum of Wildlife Arts mission and vision by serving as an advocate for current and future volunteers, working with staff and board to set expectations and maintain strong and positive communication. Um, so some of the roles of the VLC traditionally 
um, identifying issues and concerns and working as a team to resolve issues positively and in a timely manner, brainstorming and assisting in the implementation of enrichment opportunities and social engagement opportunities for volunteers both on and off site. Um, they help me maintain the hospitality funds um, account that we have to send cards and flowers to and from volunteers. Um, all kinds of ways that they help give me feedback uh, as far as the volunteer program in general. And I appreciate VLC very much. Um, we meet monthly at the museum um, and we do one offsite retreat per year. In COVID, we've kind of been meeting once every two months, but we may start going back to once a month before too long. So I have greatly appreciated the input, input from our current group, which includes Lori Bay, Sally Berman, Lisa Carlin, Bill Feinerty, Joyce Fry, Diane Hansen, Jane Malashock, Julie Matkey, Nancy McCarthy, Karen Rocky, Ellen Sanford, and Bobby Thomasma. So thank you for you guys, to you guys. Um, and then Lucretia Finley, um, I think is gonna join as one new member, but I think um, if there's one or two more people that would like to join it um, and kind of have a more of a leadership volunteer role, then please um, talk to me and I'll send you an email with a, a more, um, you know, an, an invite to join. Any questions on VLC? Okay. A volunteer appreciation party. So planning has begun for an outdoor in-person party this year, which is great. Woohoo! And details will be announced soon. I'm looking at August. Um, kind of pencil in August 3rd, but nothing is confirmed yet. Um, I do want to have one more conversation with VLC about my plans and what my idea is, um, but stay tuned for details and an invitation in the mail to that. And as in previous years, we'll announce a 2021 Volunteer of the Year at our awards um, ceremony at the Appreciation Party. So voting um, begins now for Volunteer of the Year for 2021. So please think of an exemplary volunteer um, who's worthy of some recognition and just email me your nomination. I'm gonna give you some time to do that. I think um, by the end of June would be great if you could get me um, your nomination. And all volunteers can vote. It doesn't matter how many hours or how active you've been. All volunteers um, can vote and any are eligible to be nominated unless they've won in the past um, year. They can't win two years in a row. So our 2020 winners were Susan Brooks, Natalie Goss, Allison Jones, Cynthia Quast, Bobby Thomasma, and Martha Van Genderen. Um, so please think about a volunteer of the year and let me know. I printed off some new directories that are fairly up to date. So there's a pile of them up here. If you wanna grab one on your way out, you are welcome to. And let me know if you'd like a new photo taken. Some of them are maybe older, but a lot of people like the older ones and that's fine too. So whatever you like. Um, or if you have a change in phone number or address or anything, just maybe take a look at it and let me know if things are out of date. Now I can move on to, let's see, a little more calendar type stuff. Trainings, um, trainings, events, and social outings. Uh, as far as trainings go, we have a Plain Air Fest training date of um, Friday, June 18th, which is the day before the event. And it'll be at noon, just outside on the, um, in the amphitheater. We have sneak peeks starting up again, which is really great um, with our new exhibits coming up, our new summer exhibits. So there's a sneak peek on uh, May 21st. Let's scroll this down a little bit. Okay, um, May 21st, and they're always at 11.30 and they're about half an hour. So May 21st is Unnatural Selections, June 4th at 11.30, Valued Species, and then June 25th, Woven Together where we will bring in the spider expert from um, the bison cast video. Her name is Maggie Raboyne. She is going to be leading that sneak peek. So that'll be really fun. Um, other trainings, we are planning to do a training on the Greater Yellowstone Botanical Tour, probably in early to mid July. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that project here in a little bit. Some upcoming volunteer opportunities for you guys. Um, we are creating a giant 3D gauze spider web in the Wapiti Gallery with the Woven Together exhibit. Um, we already have a plan for education. We've come up with a plan on how to build this thing, but it would be great to have a few hands to help us um, create that and install it. Um, so we've carved out some time next week already, May 24th to the 27th. That's a Monday through Thursday uh, from 1 to 3 p.m. 
I think the Wednesday date is covered, but a couple other days of the week, there might be a, be a shift there if anybody wants to help out with that. It should be fun. Um, the Greater Yellowstone Botanical Tour is a new initiative to plant native um, flowers along the sculpture trail. And the museum is collaborating with Teton Botanical Garden and the Wyoming Nature Conservancy for this project. And they are planning a planting week, June 21st through the 24th. So um, originally I heard they were gonna be planting seeds, but they're not, they're planting seedlings. So they're, they're starts already, which is gonna make it really nice. Um, and they'll have over a thousand um, seedlings to plant. So we are looking for up to six volunteers to help on each of those four days, June 21st to the 24th. And um, volunteers will have lots of direction and training from, from our partners with this and telling you where to plant them and things like that. But of course it's outdoor work and it's kneeling and it's digging. Um, so it's a little bit more physical work, but anybody who might be interested in helping garden and to get these things planted, we would love to have a few volunteers do that. Fables, Feathers and Fur restarts in June. So that'll start June 4th and it'll be every Friday through at least August. And those shifts are available on VicNet too to sign up for if anyone would like to read a story or help and or help with the art project. Um, the front desk has uh, iPod touches, which you guys have had a little bit of training with in the past or hopefully are a little bit familiar with, but those are preloaded with the mobile app tours. So it's basically the replacement for the audio tours that we used to have, the wands. And we have a pretty simple checkout process at the front desk for those, but I know it takes a little while for the front desk to do that and to help people with that. So it would be nice to have a volunteer that could be stationed at the front desk for just a couple hours, maybe in the afternoon during the busy times um, to help them check out those iPod systems. Um, you don't need to understand the technology very much, just a basic understanding of how it works. And obviously we'll train you on the whole checkout process, which is like I said, pretty easy. So we're happy to train you on that. Social stuff, we um, have hiking coming up starting in June. Uh, we're gonna do the first and third Tuesdays of the month, starting June 1st. Um, time and location is to be determined yet for hikes, but we're ready to get started doing that. And then we have one more Monday musings on May 24th in the Climber Studio. And then we're gonna kind of take a break of, for summer from, from the Monday musings um, group. And kind of in place of those musings, we're gonna do a sort of bring your own picnic, a BYOP, uh, bring your own picnic on the sculpture trail. And we'll do that on the second and fourth Mondays of the month, just as a, as a way to have a, a social thing and talk a little bit about art if we want to. Um, book club spring session was really fun and a, a good success, I think. And a copy of the book that we read the Wildlife Artist Handbook is available if anybody's interested to read that that wasn't part of book club, or if you didn't get a chance to buy a copy of it, we do have one here on site if you wanna check it out. And book club's gonna take a little summer break and then we'll restart in the fall with a new book. So if you have any suggestions for a book, please let me know. Other things relating to the uh, mobile app tour, we've had it in our, um, our goal is to do, what is it, two new apps a year. So this year we have two, um, two new mobile app tours that will be released this summer to just um, be ready for when those come out. One is focusing on women artists called Making Art in the Anthropocene. And then we'll have an app tour along with the Greater Yellowstone Botanical Tour as well. And that one's actually gonna be available in English and Spanish, which is really exciting. And um, on a side note about that, we're always looking for people to help with Spanish English translations. So if you or anyone you know speaks Spanish and would like to help us volunteer, sometimes we have a little money to pay for translators. Um, please let me know if you know someone with Spanish speaking skills. We are always looking for people with that skill set. Upcoming exhibits, um, Unnatural Selections, Wildlife and Contemporary Art opens May 22nd. You just got a sneak, a little sneak peek in there. Um, Valued Species, Animals in the Art of Andy Warhol and Iowa Way starts June 5th, goes through August 29th. Woven Together, Art and Arachnids is June 26th through October 16th. And then Western Visions, September 10th through October 3rd. Okay, look at that, that's the end of my uh, 
end of my agenda here. Um, we have time if anybody wants to have a conversation about anything or any issues or concerns or I didn't really give a COVID update. I was going to make sure everyone's aware of the sort of change in mask policy. Um, but I just ask everybody to be respectful and understanding of each other. And some people may still want to wear a mask and you're absolutely welcome to, um, but we are not mandated to anymore. So you'll notice the signs have been removed in the galleries. Um, there's no more signage. I don't think about limiting people, numbers of people in the galleries at this point. So hopefully our numbers will stay down and we can, we can do this for a while. <laughs>